Influence Continuum. This is a podcast all about influence, not just destructive influence like the ones we see in cults, but also the ethical, healthy side of influence. Dr. Stephen Hassan with another episode of the Influence Continuum. And I am so excited and so grateful to Marcy Hamilton. Uh, Marcy, I you know adore you and your work uh, ever since I read God versus the Gavel. Uh, the whole title is Justice uh, and also Justice Denied, What America Must Do to Protect Its Children. Uh, God versus the gavel, the perils of extreme religious liberty. So on spot, you are the founder and CEO of Child USA, an organization that I admire and support. The last time I saw you in person, you were honoring, I think, Leah Remini and Mike Rinder, Julie Epstein, who, who, excuse me, Julie Brown, Kay Brown, who exposed uh, uh, Epstein, after 10 years, was there. I got to meet her. Thank you for that, too. Um, you, you came to speak at, at the Forensic Think Tank at Harvard Medical School that I was a part of, talking about your plans to uh, abolish the statute of limitations for child sexual abuse. You've accomplished so much since you came and spoke in person there. And I can go on and on. I'm telling you people, you should check out this woman's bio. It's amazing. Mar Marcy, thank you for coming. And please tell us what, what we need to know about what's happening in the United States and the legal system and protecting people from predators and abusive people organizations. Well, thanks so much, Steve, and I'm a fan of yours, so this works out perfectly. Neither one of us <laughs> is wasting any time. Uh, delighted to be here. Uh, so, uh, you know, my focus is on the civil rights movement to transform children from property to being rights holders. And so, you know, that's a, that's a complex build. Uh, the United States has never signed on to the International Convention for the Rights of the Child. Uh, I didn't know that. That's true. We uh, uh, terrible. It is terrible. We have never ratified it, and so one of the th the priorities at Child USA is to persuade senators to finally ratify the convention because it it really does contain some basic rights for children that we recognize on the edges of our law, uh, but not as focused on the child. So uh, it, it's it's interesting to think that the United States is behind the rest of the world, as in the full rest of the world, uh, that has ratified the convention. Um, but, you know, the, I think the most important issue that we're looking at right now is the pervasive trafficking of children, whether it's through, uh, you know, professional traffickers or it's through child sex abuse materials online or it's through the ways in which casual perpetrators just trade kids around. Kids are being trafficked routinely, and you know th the basic reason for that is the I huge disparity in power. The child, all the way up to, in fact, age 25, is susceptible to people who will take advantage of them. They don't have the fully developed brain systems uh, the executive function. Right. 25, 26 is when we now know our frontal cortex, our executive functioning, our impulse control is developed. Yep. So the law saying, oh, you're 18, you're an adult is just behind the neuroscience and what we know about right. our brain. Yeah. I mean, you know, I helped with the uh, Epstein Settlement Fund um, mm. as a consultant, and one of the things that just struck me was that so many of the survivors of Epstein 
were just over 18 mm. uh, at the time that he preyed on them. And so they weren't getting the benefit of the child sex abuse changes in the law. Right. And, um, and so that what that did is it persuaded us that we really, we're Child USA, but we now consider anybody up to 25 or 26 um, to be in our wheelhouse because they are equally incapable of withstanding the kind of sophisticated manipulation that perpetrators have. Yeah, and I would just add people recruited by cults uh, who say, oh, they're 18, so they can decide now to turn over their trust funds or uh, get their college education funds to the cult leaders or become labor trafficking slaves. And I might add that I'm aware that you have added your power <laughs> and your brilliance to Scientology suit of three people who signed their billion-year contract as uh, underage people to the Scientology cult and um, you and we're trying to get David Miscavige personally responsible for the abuse that's being done to children. So thank you so much for entering that uh, battle because it's so important. Yeah, you know, uh, for whatever reason, I always root for the underdog. I mean, my football team can be the, right in front of me, and I'll be rooting against it for the underdog. And the people who are trapped in cults, the, those who are drawn into Scientology and see it as a healing mechanism, and then it turns out to be this anchor that holds them on the ocean floor, that's heartbreaking. And so what we have to do is we have to build the rights that keep institutions from using their power to trap others. And, uh, and I was very proud um, to be uh, part of the team and devise the First Amendment theory that really did get Danny Masterson's victims uh, from having to go through arbitration with the yeah, Scientology Church. Yeah, let me just say for, for our listeners, Danny Masterson, Scientologist, actor, and when you're in the Scientology cult, they make you sign endless documents, basically giving up your legal rights to sue, to have to do arbitration. And uh, people who were abused by him or allegedly abused by him who left, who want their day in court, Scientology was saying, nope, they signed this thing. And therefore, even though they left the cult, they, ha they permanently have given up their legal rights. And you said, no, I don't think so. That's not fair. <laughs> That's not justice. Excuse me. Yeah, I mean, the, the central point was that they were arguing that a member of their faith was permanently under their control, which means you can never leave. And it's just, it's bedrock First Amendment doctrine. You choose your religion or not. And if you right. walk away from a religion, it shouldn't be able to enforce a religious services arbitration agreement. Um, and right. we won all the way up through the Supreme Court. Um, very proud of that. And, um, and really, that's what we need more of. We need more of the justice system understanding that in these really disparate power relationships, they have to pay more attention to why it is the victim couldn't speak up or come forward or exercise the kind of power they needed for justice. And it's, yeah, it's the court's job. Yep. And you are uh, actually an inspiration for me to realize that the court, the law is about 100 years out of date with what <laughs> we understand about the human mind. And it was uh, Michael Commons and Tom Gutile at the forensic think tank that said, you need a doctorate and you need to do a quantitative study on your bite model and show a system for how the law can justly adjudicate whether there's undue influence. So I used uh, law professor emeritus uh, Alan Shefflin's social influence model in my dissertation where it analyzes the influency and their vulnerabilities, the influencer or the predatory organization and the sequences, including the bite model, the behavior, information, thought, and emotional control. And obviously, if the predator has authority, whether it's a 
priest, a teacher, uh, an educator, a president of the United States, uh, you have to weigh this out for justice. You can't just say, well, they did illegal things. Let's leave the predator out of the equation. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, it, it's been so interesting because there's been this movement and at first in the last 30 years, I couldn't understand what was really going on with arguments coming forward that we need to protect the religious institution. Um, and there was a lot of talk about that oh, as opposed to the religious believer. And they have ginned themselves into believing into something they made up that they call church autonomy, which means they shouldn't have to obey the law. Um, and of course, this is all quite convenient when the child sex abuse scandals are um, on their heels. But we've lost sight in the United States of the individual believer's right against an institution that they may have been a part of. Yep. That's the problem. Uh, and yep. once the institution you know, tries to own you and tries to hold you, that's when the First Amendment needs to be its strongest for the individual yep. to walk free. So I look at many of the religious um, scholars and many of the religious litigators right now on the right as their goal really is empowerment of the institutions at the cost of the individual believer. Uh, that's a, that's yeah, a terrifying and thing. Yeah, and I, I will add that um, for me, because I think of influence on that influence continuum, which is the title of this podcast, that there's cults along the continuum, including benign or productive you know, uh, cults that are intense, but you have informed consent, mm -hmm. you have conscience, you have critical faculties, you can read whatever you want to read, talk to ex members and leave without fear, phobias or harassment versus what the, in my opinion, the authoritarian religious, re religious groups and cults want to say, no, we, we, you know, the world is satanic. And this is when I was in the Moonies. The world is satanic. So we right. have a, we have an obligation to lie to Satan's children, to trick them into, you know, God's, you know, holy church so that we can destroy democracy because it's satanic. Right. Because we know we need a theocracy to rule the world. And if you remember, Marcy, I fasted for Nixon during Watergate because... <laughs> Moon said, God wants Nixon, despite Watergate. And when I called my father from the Capitol stairs, and we're going back to 1974, my father said, you were right, Steve. He's a crook, you know? <laughs> I'm like, Dad, you don't understand. God wants Nixon to be president. He said, Steve, he's a crook. <laughs> and I, I said, you don't understand. He said, now I know you're brainwashed. The guy's yeah. a crook. And then January 6th, Two years ago, you know, two years ago, this violent insurrection and people are going to the Capitol. My former cult was there yep. with busloads saying it was Antifa and the Mooney's newspaper, the Washington Times, was saying it's Antifa. And I'm sitting here. I'm out 47 years. <laughs> you have to understand, Marcy. I'm going, oh, my God. And, and then Trump, Pompeo, Pence, Esper spoke for the Mooney's. Yep after January 6th, saying how, what a wonderful group it was. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm going, this is surreal, and I can't stop. I got to keep telling people, wake up. Yes. This is fascism. This is the opposite of all of the ideals that we grew up believing that uh, this country stands for. Well, it, it's really free will that's at stake right now. Yep. And the... Um, I mean, setting aside the meanness of the current uh, environment, the name-calling, the divisiveness, the, the fact that we have so many Americans who don't understand that their brains are being co-opted is terrifying because those are the people that get controlled by autocratic leaders. Yep. And so, uh, you know, I, I, Trump wasn't the first guy. Uh, nope. But he brilliantly knew the circumstances and took advantage of them to the hilt. Yeah, so I want to just 
disagree mildly please, with you on please. that. And I think that there were brilliant operators and in intelligence and counterintelligence who were telling him what to do. And he's not brilliant. He's a malignant narcissist who's following instructions by Putin, by the Christian right, by the libertarians, the anarchists who want to create chaos so that well, they I, can take yeah. over. I, I didn't mean to say he was brilliant, but ah. but whatever he did was done brilliantly because it looked like this guy was going to make America great again. I mean, that was what he was saying. And at the same time, it was the serious threat to democracy in our history. And, totally. uh, you know, I don't know if you've watched The Vow yet. Of course. Right? About, of course. I know a lot about yeah. Nexium. Right? Nexium and, and Keith Rainier. Um, yep. I, I, I wish the American public would at least watch the first four episodes because what they can see is the way someone becomes uh, popular in a group, a leader in a group, abuses that power, and then is able to exercise uh, undue influence. Yeah, it is definitely. so clear. It is, and I just got a preview of an upcoming Hulu series about the Lawrence Ray, Sarah Lawrence mm -hmm. cult. He was convicted of trafficking, and they have videos in that series of him gaslighting, shaming, abusing, physically torturing uh. the members. It was heartbreaking to watch, but it's a case study in mind control, mm -hmm. but more like pimp trafficker mind control right. than the more subtle multi-level marketing NLP type that Keith Raniere was perpetrating yeah. on people, right? Yeah. But um, I also want to just comment that uh, ex-Scientologist Jeffrey Augustine wrote a brilliant piece on Massimo Intervigne of Cessna in Italy and he called it him out as a cult propagandist. Wow. So there are all these scholars of religion that uh, were on payrolls of destructive groups to say, oh, they're religious groups, we can't criticize them, who's to say what a cult is? Right. And they're lobbying the Macron government right now to stop funding the cult awareness group. I don't know if you were aware. I wasn't aware of in that. In Europe called FECRIS but they're very intimidated because of the Japanese who are saying no to the Moonies. Mm -hmm. uh, they were the largest consumer fraud perpetrators in Japanese history. And this young, this man whose mother joined the Moonies killed the ex-premier Abe and it opened up the window for the media to go, wait a minute, all these other Politicians are in bed with the Moonies too. Mm -hmm. And they're talking about taking away their religious tax exemption. And the cults are freaking out because that's the last thing they want. Right. Because they want they want the to, as you said, institutional power and control uh, to make more money and abuse people. Well, and, and you know, our focus is on children and mm. uh, it has been hard to educate the public that you need to follow the money. That uh, so much of what's going on is preservation of their dollars um, and their images, even though it's thousands upon thousands, millions of children being sexually abused. Uh, they really aren't, mot they're still not motivated by no. actual remorse, remorse, and they are still arguing that they should be protected by law against being liable for all the harm they've done. Yeah. So the, you know, the, the mindless religious liberty and religion is always good lobby is yeah. one of the most dangerous in the world. And it is Absolutely. very powerful right now, sadly. Absolutely. And let's not forget, they donate a lot of money and they have followers who will send their people to vote for yep. politicians so they pretty much know not to go cross any destructive cults because they could come after them and uh, the congressman uh, Donald Frazier uh, who was investigating the Moonies for Korean CIA activities in the United States um, when he published his, his uh, report just weeks before Jonestown, 
uh, the Moonies lobbied against him, and he was supposed to be reelected, and he lost. Yeah. No, they, they, so they've it got sent a message. They're political. Yeah, so they sent a message to all the other politicians. Don't cross us. Don't say negative things. We have a lot of money. We have a lot of labor mm-hmm. to put people to. And, uh, and, and you, I know you read The Cult of Trump, yep. and I, I'm still astounded that people don't know the new apostolic reformation has over 40 million Americans who are the base— uh, and the media keeps getting it wrong, saying they're Christian evangelicals. The Christian evangelicals are like, this is not Jesus's teachings with someone's a prophet or an apostle. Right. That, you know, casts out demons and, and, and convinces everyone Satan is all powerful. They need to follow the apostle or the prophet no matter what. Uh, that's not religion. That's l- my understanding of, of the Abrahamic faces. It's a love thing love god (laughs) love your neighbor as you love yourself it's about love service helping the poor helping the child helping the widow not about power greed money uh private jets well children that's right and you know i studied john calvin the uh, reformation fame and um he had this fascinating statement in which he said the religious groups which he was talking about, the Christians, should never let the government take over raising the funds to help the poor. Because if they let the government take that over, they will lose their path. That the money between government and religion is corrupting. And that same concept was embraced by James Madison when he wrote the First Amendment and included the separation of church and state. But Mm. right now we have religious groups connected by an umbilical cord to government funds. And so the the end result is that we have had a clear crisis for 20 years, spotlighting on the Catholic Church, but of course extending to many, many other religious faiths and private and university, et cetera, et cetera. But we have not had one hearing in Congress— on the clergy sex abuse crisis. Now, Australia has done an entire royal commission on the issue. England and um, Scotland, Ireland, they've done studies. They've done government-backed studies. In the United States, politicians are so fearful of saying anything negative about religion, regardless of what it does, that, uh, that they kowtow to the bishops rather than holding them to account and as a result they are forsaking the children and uh, that that political dynamic is part of what's corrupting our culture and it it is uh you know it's it's the right wing in the catholics it is the right wing among evangelicals uh banding together to become the christian nation they've always wanted to have which is, of course, historically a fallacy. Nobody fallacy. was one faith at the beginning. They were, yep. they were actually killing each other over faith. But yep. uh, it's, uh, this is a matter of lawmakers standing up for what's right, and they're not doing yep. it. Yeah, and let's, let's remember, too, that um, neuroscience trauma experts have said categorically, and the world, I believe, corporal punishment is child abuse. Yes. It's bad for the brain. It's bad for development. And a, and a, a retired social worker wrote a, a, a book actually on this topic called uh, The Holocaust Lessons. And he cited a study with Germans who did not turn their fellow Jews into the Nazis versus the others who did. And they were not beaten as children to be obedient to authority. There you go. Isn't that interesting? Yep. No, it's part of looking at children as human beings from birth. And to this day, we have the parental rights movement, which is really just another word for treating your children like property uh, over which you have 100% control. Um, And that's why you get children dying in faith healing communities. That's why you get exemptions to the vaccination requirements that save 
everybody. Um, yes. And it's, uh, it's mindless deference to mm -hmm. religion as a political factor. And yeah. for me, as a Protestant, mm. uh, I, I just have to say, we all have to go back to the framers. The framers agreed on one thing at the convention. Uh, and I'm not talking about the Federalist Papers. I'm talking about at the Constitutional Convention, mm -hmm. Madison's notes. What they all agreed on is you cannot trust human beings. Uh, human beings are fallible, and they ache and fight for power. And so you need a governing system that's a machine that will deter all of those impulses to power. And in the end, you need a separation of church and state to deter those impulses to power. Our problem right now is we've abandoned that concept of uh, always, always get the power mongers out of the way of the public good. And, yep. uh, and unfortunately, right now, we are divisive and we're not thinking in those terms. Yep. And the obvious thing that I just want to say is children are our future. Yes. They're our investment. They really are our future. They're our legacy. It's, it's our hope. And if we don't educate young people about civics and what, is it, what does it mean to have a separation of church and state? What, what, is, what is happening online is a uh, rewiring of young people's brains because of studies on how to make attention addicted yep. to social media platforms and such. And it's harming people. Children's attention, even adults' attention spans are going down. Dramatically. I did a, a very interesting interview with the psychiatrist Carl Marcy, who is a Harvard psychiatrist, social neuroscientist. It's called Rewired. And his work is something that really needs to be elevated, in my opinion, because he, he goes developmentally uh, about the negative effects of our digital environment. So Humans awful. were not born to be in digital environments. This is the wild, wild west. Yes. And there's no, there's no laws protecting people. I don't people. know if you remember uh, at this point. I, I think we've all forgotten, but there was that moment when the Internet burst on the scene, and we had law professors around the country saying, a finally, true and pure democracy. And I, I was a copyright scholar at the time before I mm. turned to religion uh, issues. Mm -hmm. And I kept hearing in the back of my mind James Madison and the framers talking about how you couldn't trust human beings with power right. and that there was no way this was going to be some kind of panacea of liberty and justice. And, of course, it's devolved into the worst instincts of human nature in which uh, billionaires are using their wealth as an excuse to harm everyone. Yes. Um, so that is the issue of the day. That is totally I, I agree. agree. And yeah. and a lot of them were are in the Ayn Rand cult of selfishness is good and altruism right. is evil, or the so social Darwinist in in not understanding Darwinism, yeah. saying you know we make more money, therefore we're superior, and other people will die, but our families will be okay. Right. And that's toxic, totally and that's toxic. not even close to being, like, true. No, no. Well, the, the, you know, when you have this kind of, this is like when the railroad started, right? I mean, we had our uh, uh, evil but highly successful people building the infrastructure of the United States. Uh, and that's what happened with the Internet. Uh, mm. These are innovative, brilliant people who are capable of building something that's never been in place before, but no one else gets it in time to uh, regulate it. And, there, and it's just, it's late, but it's time to catch up. Uh, and I, I do think Congress is on the way to certain, like the Earn It Act, so that you could sue Facebook, you could sue Twitter if you're harmed by what they put up there. Uh, but until now, they have been utterly protected because they're original, unique, and nobody understood it. So uh, yeah. it, I, I think I read that, that in the Washington Post that Facebook has 1,800 full-time lobbyists in Washington, D.C. Oh, yeah. Or something. Yeah. 
Yeah. They, they assign multiple people to each senator and congressman to right. wine and dine and schmooze and whatever yep. else. Yeah, and, and portray themselves as saving everybody while they're dragging us all down into, the, the, into hell because they win when people get angry. Yeah. And so they use that as the algorithm that takes us all down these rabbit holes. Yeah. Um, I, it's, uh, so, we can change So can it. I push you to comment on the Federalist Society and our current uh, Supreme uh, Court yes. and your opinions, please? So there's, you know, I clerked at the United States Supreme Court with Justice O'Connor, 88-89. Mm -hmm. And at that point, the Federalist Society had already formed its cabal, but it was in its early phases. But it was largely uh, white men uh, who were very conservative who would meet in secret in the building to drive results at the United States Supreme Court according to their conservative lights. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and I, I was clerking for O'Connor and working on the abortion cases. And let's just say I was approached repeatedly wow. uh, to find out what was going on and what she was going to say. And of course, my answer was always what she was already saying, which is that she wasn't going to overrule Roe. Um, but the, uh, that movement took fire and it became much like a cult as uh, you would define it, with yep. the bite model. Yep. Um, but, and, and of course, male dominant. But when Leonard Leo became their top person who was helping to advise on judicial nominees, he is a very conservative Catholic. Yeah, he's on the cons uh, Catholic Information Center board along with William Barr exactly. before he was yeah. AG. Yeah. Please yeah. continue. So, so uh, Leonard Leo is deeply connected, clearly, with some of the most conservative Catholics in the country and the movement. Yep. And I, I still am waiting for the evangelicals to stand up and ask, why are there six conservative Catholics? If you include Gorsuch, who was raised Catholic, he now goes yep. to the Episcopalian Church. But how could there be six and not a single evangelical? Like why, what was going on and what was going on is a very intentional building of a Catholic structure which would be autocratically controlled by the Vatican. Uh, and, and we see what they've already done. They took no time. As soon as they had the votes, they tossed Roe v. Wade and they wrote an opinion which is theological more than legal. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Leonard Leo is responsible for the court we've been given. Uh, he's just been given uh, over a billion to I run. I saw that. Yeah, to run an organization to continue with the, his success. But the mm -hmm. American people are waking up. Uh, and I think one of the biggest mistakes the uh, progressives have made over time is they have accepted the label of secular mm -hmm. so that it was in the pro-life movement it's been the conservative groups taking the high ground because it was all religious and then that those that bunch of secularists well secularists aren't as important as religious believers i mean that was the whole way of talking and we did not hear from all of the many religious progressives standing up and saying Actually, I'm religious, but I don't believe what you do. Right. So, so that's now changing, and yeah. it's starting to change. And I'm uh, I'll be doing the oral argument in Florida on February 24th, representing five members of the clergy fighting the abortion bans in that state. Yeah, so I, I, I don't know if you are aware, but I I, I uh, interviewed Frank Schaefer Jr the son of the most famous evangelical uh, Frank Schaefer that everyone adored. Mm -hmm. And he said, I feel guilty. I talked my father into going against abortion before that meeting, uh, you know, and, and with um, uh, I'm blocking on the names of the other Protestants that were there. Protestants were pro-abortion. Exactly. Completely. Exactly. 
and, and he yeah. he's going like, no, this is not this. You know, it's not the government choosing what women can do with their bodies. Right. That's not right. Okay. <laughs> no, the um, the vast majority of believers, setting aside the um, rank and file Catholics, not the not all right. Catholics, the, the cafeteria Catholics were in a different spot, but. Uh, Protestants and Jews, and many across the United States, it's not that they were pro-abortion, but they right. were offended by the concept that a woman could not defend her life right. against a pregnancy. Right. And it turns out that's where over 70% of the American public still is, but yep. we have a Supreme Court that is out of touch and controlled by a Catholic mindset. And in the yep. Catholic mindset, what are women supposed to do? Their highest calling is pregnancy. Hmm. That is higher than anything else they will do. And so they see a world legitimately as a world where women will be pregnant as many times as they possibly can yeah. and that they will not get the medical care they need when they're going to die or be permanently disabled or when their fetus is going to die. Yep. So it's it's a cruel, cruel movement, but it's coming straight out of Leonard Leo's pocket. Yeah. And I also want to add, Marcy, that my understanding, because I get asked to counsel people in Opus Dei and other extremist uh, Catholic groups, um, they think the current pope is evil. I know. They think he's <laughs> satanic. So it's not, and, and, and in fact, my understanding is that the current Pope is like speaking out for protecting the climate, helping immigrants, helping the poor against power and money, um, yep. by the way. Um, so there's the schism happening in the, within the Catholic Church. Um, and, and I think with Benedict's passing, maybe uh, maybe some more Catholics might wake up and realize that let's go back to the teachings of love and service. And you know, it's, it's such a fascinating time right now for schism within the Catholic Church. I, uh, we were successful in joining forces with uh, Jennifer Wortham and then the First Lady of Sierra Leone to get the first World Day for victims of child sex abuse, sexual exploitation, and violence. Mm. And that was held on November 18th. And I was invited to come to Rome to speak mm -hmm. about this new amazing day, which is going to remind people they have to do the right thing. Just by chance, the German priests were there that day and mm -hmm. had all been called to Rome because they are unabashedly performing gay marriages they are not embracing uh, what they are being told to embrace about uh, women's health care. They are liberals in the church, mm -hmm. and they were basically told they better quit. Mm. Um, and then I fly back to the United States with some of the most conservative bishops in the United States, and mm. they're all over, uh, yes, of course we want zero exceptions for the abortion bans. Um, hmm. We're not worried about women working. We're not worried about their welfare. So the, the the world is splitting up within the Catholic Church, and we'll see. Yeah, and and interestingly, going back for a second, if I may, to the New Apostolic Reformation, yes. I recently had a former pastor of one of these groups on with Fred Clarkson, who's been tirelessly writing about the Christian right and their desire to do Project Blitz, mm -hmm. um, which was taking over in states, legislatures, and, and school boards and everything else. But they recently um, reported there's a schism happening in the New Apostolic Reformation from those groups that are sticking with, God told me Trump won in 2020, versus the others that are like, well, actually he didn't win and we yeah. need to like rethink how we present ourselves about political things. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting too. And unfortunately, as far as I can tell, progressive activists are not really taking advantage in messaging about what, you know, what's actually happening right. to, 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 to help move people, to enlighten people 
that we're in a kind of third world war right now, and a lot of it is information warfare yep. um, with bad actors who don't want America to continue to be a uh, dominant player in right. the world. And, they and want to undermine actively, our currency. They're actively manipulating us. Yes. Right? I mean, that's what annoys me the most is that a lot of this misinformation is coming from Russia or China. Yep. Um, and then we have to listen to our relatives during the holidays <laughs> retell us what is absolutely not true. Yes. So, uh, and so I, I don't disagree about the world, uh, third world war um, in principle, but I think in order for the public to truly understand what's happening in the United States, we have to toss the phrase culture war from the beginning, this has been a religious war. Mm. And it, it's not a culture war. It is a religious war to stamp the country as anti-abortion, anti-women's rights, anti-children's rights, anti-LGBTQ rights. And yeah, so we'll go back to the Manhattan Declaration, which was that agreement of the right-wing Catholics and Protestants on those three major points right. women's rights gay rights and the need for them to have more freedom yep. to impose their version of religion on everybody else precisely no that it's the beginning of the downward trek to where we are now where the only way to save the current um situation because of these religious wars is for everybody to stand up and declare what they believe and not to accept that anyone else's faith can be imposed on them. It's yes. the imposition on others that, has, that is so toxic. It's not that you can't believe what you want. Everybody can believe whatever they want. Greatest right in the United States Constitution, not honored in many, many countries. 100% yep. absolute right to believe what you want, but you don't have a right to do anything you want. And right. that is where we have fallen down. And the, the, real, the way to track this is the First Amendment, when you're considering rights, you consider harm to others. So if you're going to stop, if you're going to let the Amish quit paying taxes for mm. uh, Social Security, if you're going to let them do that, then you have to consider what the harm would be to the country. And mm -hmm. it turns out the Supreme Court said the harm to the country would be too great if we were to let organizations just at will not provide for um, the, the employment taxes they're supposed to, to uh, pay. Mm -hmm. But then we got, and this is part of this movement against freedom, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And what RIFRA says is the only things you look at are the individual the burden on the individual of the law and whether it accommodates that individual. You never look at who it harms as a third party. You never look at the greater public good. So that's how you get the ridiculous conclusion that the uh, military should not be able to have a vaccine requirement mm. because RIFRA did not let anybody consider the harm to the public. So that's, that's, the, that's the bottom line. That's what we've got to dump. Yeah, that's so insightful. Marcy, you are a fount of knowledge. <laughs> and um, I, 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 I want to just open a general invitation to educate my listeners because I think I have a, a pretty smart group of people who are wanting to know what's going on, wanting to know what they can do. And obviously, mm -hmm. I'm going to ask them to support Child USA uh, and, and, and your efforts to educate legislators about what bills are coming down the pike. And, and, and I think there's something happening in Pennsylvania. I oh, read yes. a press release yes. recently. Yeah, P Pennsylvania is Pennsylvania. Uh, unfortunately, my uh, place my husband brought me 38 years ago. Uh, and I and would, you're in Philly still, <laughs> I'm right? I'm in Philly. Our offices yeah. are in Philly. but And I'm at Penn. Yeah. But yeah. The, the killer in Pennsylvania is that we've been considering a window for child sex abuse victims, which should be a straightforward, nonpartisan, bipartisan effort for 17 yep. years. And um, in 2023, we were on a clearly open path. It was like 
We were all just going to get on the sleigh ride, and it was just going to take us up to next May. There was going to be a referendum. Everybody's going to vote for a constitutional amendment, and we got the rights for the victims. Both houses now have created political theater that has mm. stymied this movement. Mm. Um, we will succeed, but they've managed to move the constitutional amendment on the ballot vote from May to November. Mm. Um, and it's just another example of politicians not valuing children and yep. not valuing victims uh, as much as their own political needs. And uh, it's, it's been disappointing, uh, but this is where we are in this country. Children are collateral damage until um, you press hard enough. Yeah. And I want to come back to your willingness to help mm -hmm people who were raised in Scientology as children, because what I'm seeing now are scores of people leaving authoritarian cults, religious cults who were born into it. Their parents had joined, they didn't choose it. They were abused. They weren't pa properly parented because their parents' obligation was to the cult leader yeah. or to the group instead of to their children. Um, and they're coming out and they're very angry and upset. But the good news is they're willing to start sharing their stories about their abuse. And so, you know, and then the, the other piece is that mental health professionals are not trained how to talk to people who've been victims of undue influence. Yep. And especially if they talk about being in a religious group. It's this hands off, yeah. you know, people have a right to believe instead of realizing, no, this is, you know, it's having sex with three year olds because Moses, yeah. David Berg said, God said you have to do it is ridiculous. What? Yeah, it's just wrong. It's, it's wrong. Uh, I mean, if I would say that the single most important message of my entire career mm. is that. A religious group that's harming others is not worthy of deference. Harming others is what you can't do in the United States. And the deference by the media, by um, lawmakers to religious groups that are letting children die, letting children be sexually abused, letting women be assaulted, letting them um, be uh, destroyed emotionally and physically, uh, if that's what they're doing, that's just illegal. And so let's yes. just take off the mask and look at it for what it is. It's a group of humans that have made huge mistakes and need to pay for it. And yeah. why don't we just leave religion to the deities? Um, but, <laughs> you know, our big problem now is humans are in charge and they are fallible. Yeah, yeah. So aside from funding your organization if people are listening to this and and i have listeners around the world uh and i think it was very important you talked about australia doing a much more important investigation that has never happened here england and other places talk to all of my listeners please about you know what needs to happen and what they can potentially do well, so what needs to happen, obviously, uh, the funding you send to us, we, we are a small but mighty band of social scientists and lawyers that are mm -hmm. changing the world. So we appreciate yep. any, any donation. But, um, but help us share our message. Uh, help us by uh, sharing it on your networks. Uh, we have a, a constant contact we post every Thursday. It's always new material. People are always contacting me and saying, aren't you exhausted? How do you have new material every week? It's just we have an amazing staff. We are the only think tank for children in the world. So when I first formed Child USA, I looked up to see who our competitors would be in terms of think tanks. There weren't any others for children. And I think that speaks volumes. We want to be the Brookings Institute for children. And, uh, and we're on the way. Can I say amen or is that inappropriate? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> no, I just, you know, you you are fantastic. You're doing such cutting edge work. You're brilliant. You're a scholar, you're a professor. You're 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 uh, you're doing the cutting edge work to get us out of this mess. 
that um, very, very disturbed, uh, narcissistic, so psychopathological people and groups uh, have, have brought us to the brink like we are. Well, thank you. I'm doing every bit I possibly can. I guess I was born a workaholic. I love this work. Uh, it's my fun, if you can believe it. And anyone who feels more protected or uplifted um, by what we're doing, thank you. That that I want to thank yeah, and you. Yeah, I think I think elevating young people's voices um, too. That they should be telling their parents, hey. Listen to this interview with Marcy Hamilton. I'd like to get your opinion, Dad, mm -hmm. Mom. Wink, wink. Yep. You know, what can we do to help children's rights? You love me, don't you? <laughs> you know? No, get, and get the kids it, involved. Part of it is literally just stating the premise of what we're doing that mm. kids were legally the property of their fathers uh, a little over a century ago. And now we, they, they were labor property. That's all right. they were. Right. Uh, and now it's a matter of filling in all of the check marks, rights to education, rights to health, rights to survive by being vaccinated and getting ordinary yes. medical treatment, uh, rights to be able to get protection when an adult has sexually assaulted you or when a system is putting you at risk. They have to be, my, my favorite image is, there's a big conference table and all the mahuffs are around it and they're all adults, but at the end, there are four kids in their suits sitting at the conference table. So mm -hmm. that they have to be treated like human beings and not just some kind of add-on concern out in the back hall. Yeah, totally. Yeah. <sighs> So, um, and training lawyers, you're still teaching? Yeah. We're training lawyers. We now have a grant to train judges. Oh. Yeah. And at Penn, I'm teaching constitutional law and law and religion and politics. So, pretty fun. So, uh, how, do I, how do I get there to <laughs> educate judges about brainwashing and mind control? Please, look, you know, Ab summon we'll me. We'll talk. We'll talk. Yeah, I'd, yeah. I'd love to be involved with that. And I, I believe you do your annual fundraiser in the fall, typically. So this year it'll be November 2nd. And okay. uh, we do it at the National Constitution Center. And uh, it's, it's really the most uplifting event. We have over 300 people. We'll have more this year already. And it's like a wedding. Everybody's coming back to see everybody and support each other. Whether I it's come. you should come, it is so. I definitely. It's inspiring um, yes. for survivors and for everybody else. And I, you know, when I started this thing, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I've never run an organization um, or a nonprofit or anything or held an event. But yeah, it's turned into a, a, just a big, warm gathering of good people fighting for children. So if you're in that category, please come and enjoy it. Yeah. It's a great night. And I'm going to just go out on a limb and <laughs> say, if some wealthy person who could give a billion dollars to <laughs> Leonard Leo to impose his version of you know authoritarian Christianity on the rest of us, why can't somebody give a billion dollars to protect children, please? Especially if it's an international quest yeah. to lift up consciousness around taking care of children it's our future yeah. it's completely our future um and we're child usa we've developed a subdivision child global it's just every child shouldn't be on average headed into lack of education lack of medical care and sexual abuse that is just a crummy agenda Yep, and you we started by you saying the U.S. is one of the few countries that did not pass the the child. Tell the, us again. So the International Convention for the Rights of the Child, the right. United States signed it but never ratified it. So it is not controlling law in the United States, where it's been ratified by every other country that would sign such a thing in the world. It is. Um, why did the United States not sign it? 
because of parental rights that put children at risk. And so we are going to be pushing for the United States to get on board. So that's something I want to ask my listeners. Go to Child USA, find out about this, contact your senators and congressmen, like get on this. This is really, because this will be a game changer, correct? Completely. If it's ratified. Completely. And it's, at this point, it should be obvious to everyone each of these rights and the only ones who are fighting them still view children as the property that the parents control. And that's just yeah. wrong. So if you're a parent or a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle uh, or you just love kids, help help us do this because it's going to it's going to have a very deep ripple effect for human rights everywhere. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Steve. So you get the last word, but, you know, continued success. And um, I just hope this this interview will help uh, propel uh, some people to action to really understand this is a big one people protecting children's rights in the law and holding perpetrators and authoritarian cults responsible criminalizing their behavior where they're harming uh, young people and young people are under 25 is that the... absolutely zero yeah, to that's 25 another biggie. That's a very important point, too, that I did not realize uh, till we, we ch caught up today that that Child USA has has recognized the neuroscience yes. that is everybody who knows the, the the mind, the brain, child developmental theory knows that, you know, it takes time to become fully human. Yeah, no, it does. And, and, and Steve, I love what you do, as you know. And uh, you've always been such an, an amazing ally um, mm. fighting against those who will use religion to harm others. Yeah. So well, thank you. You have been my teacher, my mentor, and inspiration. And it's really going to take a village. It's going to take a lot of good people joining together. As you say, you have a think tank to really think about what is strategy to, to pull our country away from this 50 year, you know, march yeah. into authoritarianism that's been taking yeah. place. Absolutely. Thank you so much. You, you are a dear friend and I appreciate you for having me on now. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks again. So Marcy Hamilton, Child USA, nonprofit academic think tank, interdisciplinary evidence-based research to improve laws, public policy to end child abuse and neglect. And you're a professor of law. Again, go to the Child USA and learn about this amazing person, Marcy Hamilton. Thank you, and we'll be in touch. Thank you so much.